In this episode we'll be talking about what does it mean to democratize service design. We'll be talking about the role and value of the brand design thinking. And finally we'll talk about how to successfully embed service design in an organization. And here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, my name is Jerry Scullion and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, my name is Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to design services that have a positive impact on people and business. My guest in this episode once opened the show for the fun loving criminals. He's currently the service design principal at EY Seren and Island and you might know him from his podcast This Is Human Centered Design. His name is Jerry Scullion. In the next 30 minutes or so, Jerry and I will be talking about what does it mean to democratize service design. We'll be talking about the role and value of the brand design thinking. And finally, we'll touch upon how to successfully embed service design in an organization. We post new videos every week here on this channel. So if you're looking for a way to take your service design skills to the next level, be sure to subscribe and don't forget to click that bell icon so you'll be notified when new videos are out. So that's all for the introduction and now let's quickly jump into the interview with Jerry. Welcome to the show, Jerry. Thanks for having me, Mark. Awesome to have a fellow, I don't know, what shall we call it, uh, content creator. <laughs> I don't know, people call me a design troublemaker. A design <laughs> troublemaker. I, I haven't gotten that title yet, so we we'll feel honored. Jerry, uh, I mentioned it in the introduction already, but um, for the people who don't know who you are, you're running, uh, uh, let, a podcast called This Is Human Centered Design. Uh, Correct. Tell us a little bit about that. What is it? Where can people find it? Why did you start making it? All right. Um, I started it uh, earlier last year um, when I was based in Australia. I'm now based in Dublin. I've just moved home. Um, the, the podcast came off the back of many conversations over a couple of years where I was repeating myself and uh, having the same sort of conversations that I just wanted to be able to create something that enabled conversation around topics such as breaking tribalism and design and yeah. allowing it to be a little bit more accessible for people who are trying to get into the discipline of design. And um, from that, we, we started with a couple of episodes more as a, as a trial to see how we get on. And um, it's just gone from strength to strength. And it's it's now currently in the top 10 and um, a lot of, you know, the, the podcast listings and iTunes and stuff. So it's been a great success and it's something that I'm I'm really proud of. And um, I've got a great team of people working on the podcast with Cheryl Lee Ryan, who I know you've had on the, the episode as well, Cheech, and Adrian Tan in Australia um, as well, who's uh, podcasting about uh, product management and how service design and product management and UX all can work together, which is great. <coughs> Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people who are listening or watching this episode will be interested in in what you are doing. So if they're looking for This Is HCD or This Is Human Centered Design, where can they find uh, the episodes? Yeah, um, they can check it out on thisishcd.com, um, mm -hmm. but it's also on Spotify and iTunes and um, lots of the, the major podcast hosting uh, services. So it's it's pretty accessible. Um, it goes under This Is HCD or the Human Centered Design Podcast. Awesome. I'll, I'll add the uh, links also in the show notes. So if people really can't find it, just check the show notes. Be sure to subscribe. It's it's really cool. Jerry, uh, first question. This is usually the first question I ask people, but now it's the second one. Uh, and that is, do you remember the first time you got in touch with service design? The first time I was introduced to service design, like I'm, I'm actually a qualified industrial designer. I studied industrial design uh, way back in 2002. Um, I was aware of it in the early 2000s, but I was living in Ireland at the time and it wasn't really uh, mature enough um, to, to get a job as a service designer. My first encounter was at Cochlear, the medical device company in 2011, I believe, where I was brought in from a UX background there was more strategic UX at that time and uh, I was designing a new service for them called My Cochlear so that was my first real you know big project about designing a new service that something wasn't there that wasn't just a digital mm. interface mm. Mm. and, and th 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 there was like in the 2000s 
when was uh, this? Uh, 2010, 2011, maybe mm, around that mm, time. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. So about six or seven years ago that I've been mm. working primarily as, as a service designer since then. Cool. Jerry, you gave me three interesting topics. Well, it was really fun to have topics from somebody who's usually on the other side of the microphone. <laughs> yeah. So well, we'll dive into uh, your three topics in a minute. Uh, you've got uh, some questions started printed next to you and we'll co-create the show from here on, right? Great. Are you ready? Absolutely, let's do it. All right, so the first topic that I want to address with you is this one. Democratization of design. And do you have a question started that goes along with this one? Okay, let me have a look. <laughs> um, I'll go with this one. Why? Why the democratization of design is important. Okay, well, go ahead. So democratization of design, um, let's break it down and s- just explain it a little bit. Uh, democratization of design is you know, making it accessible to people who are really not designers mm-hmm. or from a not design background. Um, I believe it's important to, to bring people who are from the non-design discipline into the conversation as early as possible. Um, it's really important for the success of a project, but also the success of, of services to be delivered by bringing people along on those journeys. Um, I don't believe, though, however, that it's it's always possible to make those uh, people who are non-designers designers, but I think it's important to create a shared understanding and a, and a shared language between those those disciplines. So it's just going back to what I spoke about uh, earlier about the podcast and breaking down tribalism and design. Um, it's like you could be working with product managers or com- could be working with visual designers um, or you could be working with people in the business profession or like financial backgrounds. The democratization of design really focuses on delivering the outcome and making sure that you're all behind that outcome and you're able to work towards delivering that outcome as opposed to like getting stuck down into the the politics of the nitty gritties of mm. you know who owns what and who's doing what so, uh, so what do you it's, see, it's such an important you, piece you, to, yeah. to bring what, what do you see as the big challenges uh no. re- regarding to democratization of design so I, I guess the ownership of who does what mm in a, a general project delivery um, process. So I know um, I've spoken about this in the past around, you know, user experience people. How do they contribute to like some of the, the pro- processes within service design? And the democratization of design, I guess, it's not really so much about having ownership of things, it's having a shared ownership and having a, a shared understanding of what you're trying to achieve. So certain times you might have user experience people who are much stronger at certain um, skills um, and it should be encouraged that they're able to do those processes as opposed to like saying, oh, well, that could be a, a service design piece. We only do this. Mm. This is ours. Like, it's not about that. It's about being able to work human to human and working as a, as a team. So democratization um, extends beyond that into the business function and really articulating and helping the maturity of an organization grow so that they're able to understand why we're doing things and you know why we're not doing it the way they've always done it. We're, we're doing it because we want to get a shared understanding and we want to try and get a, the best possible outcome for the delivery of a new service. Mm. And is democratization of design, uh, how, how far are we off from true democratization in your perspective? How far from like, I, I guess, is there a point where we're trying to get to and I... Well, I don't think it's ever going to be um, realized, really. It's it's about having an empathy for the other person that you're working with and saying, look, it's okay if you don't understand what's going on. Ask me any question you want. It's about having that trust and making sure that when they do work with us, they're not feeling like they're like excluded. Mm. It's been an inclusive process. Mm. So um, and I think more and more, the role of the service designer is becoming closer to that, that almost hand-holding piece. Uh, taking businesses through that process of of transformation. I hate using that word transformation, but it it really, it sums up what we're trying to do a lot of the time. Like it's it's, it's a change management function in some ways. So Jerry, do you think we need some specific skills or yeah, specific skills to actually uh, enable or help democratization of service design or design in general? The first thing I'm thinking about is we need to be excellent communicators. 
communication like everything is is kind of key to the delivery of of anything so being excellent communicators uh having a natural humility for um the people going through this process we're effectively changing behaviors and we're disrupting people in their day-to-day lives mm. you know changing behaviors and, and how they work in a lot of the stuff that we do um things that we probably could do um and what's important to do is i think is is losing an arrogance about um what we do and uh enabling people to to buy into what we do so sh- sharing uh the work that we're doing is, is super important uh in anything to do with democratization of design um again like m- my whole vision of democratization of design is not to make people designers it's about getting another outlook and another perspective mm. Um, on the work to make sure that it's been as inclusive as possible. So, uh, final question regarding this topic. What do you do on a day-to-day basis to contribute to this? My my role like at EY Sarah in Ireland, I'm, I'm the service design principal. A lot of my work is down to, um, I guess, trying to I- increase the awareness of the capability of service design. Um, it's working with clients to really identify areas of opportunity across their full ecosystem as opposed to just thinking of it as a touch point and working at a at a very macro level um on a day-to-day basis it could look like you know i've got a little girl so i'm up at five o'clock every morning uh which is really kind of her um it's why i look so haggard and i'm actually only 25 i can empathize with you (laughs) (laughs) okay right so my day starts really early and um it finishes relatively early at around 9 30 but in between then i'm back to backs a lot of meetings um i'm not not doing as much of the craft of design anymore in terms of um the actual you know creation of of artifacts mostly it's around uh, education and facilitation of of the of the craft Mm. So, Jerry, uh, let's move on to topic number two. And I know this will be an interesting one as well, because this it contains the, the magic uh, words at this moment, because this is about the brand of design thinking. Do you have a question mm-hmm. started that goes along with this one? Uh, this is a tough one. Um, what if, I'm going to go for same again. So reliable, why the brand of design thinking is important. Maybe what is um, the brand of design oh, thinking? Well, this is this is really important because um, moving from Australia, where design thinking, you know, it entered the conversation for me as early back as my, my second time in Australia in 2007, 2008. It was discussed, uh, and I remember like going, going to interviews and people saying, do you do design thinking? And to me, it was actually such a funny thing to say to a designer who's an industrial designer, like, do you do design thinking? I'm like, yeah, well, what else would I do? You know, it's <laughs> it's it's a given. So um, and I, I started to see it creep more into the conversations and why design thinking is is really important is I worked in several large organizations where there were there were training lots of mm. people to become design thinkers and they were accredited to become design thinkers. And it started to create a new wave of of profession that um, started to creep up into into workshops where um, it wasn't so bad. I was getting people pushing back saying, well, like, you know, I've, I'm a design thinker. And I was like, OK, well, you know, I'm I'm been doing this for, for a long time. So I started to see a little bit of resistance between, you know, someone who's just mm. entered the craft mm-hmm. and they've done a, a little bit of design thinking. Um, so design thinking, the brand, whenever I, whenever I speak about it, I, I try to understand the context of where that person has come from and the legacy that they, they hold. So I'm like, okay, well, what is design thinking for you? And um, I've spoken a little bit about this with, with Mark Stickdorn, and I know you've also had on, the, yeah. I've had it on the podcast as well. And it's really trying to understand wh- how they're using it because it's just a toolkit. It's it's nothing to be afraid of. I don't mind when people say, like, I do design thinking. I'm like, hey, right, but what are you doing with the design doing side of the conversation? <laughs> everyone is saying everyone is saying the same thing. It's 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 pretty much been spoken about to death. But um too often what I find is the design thinkers, they will take it to a point and they almost become an SME, like a subject matter expert in that area. And it's okay, going back to the the, the first question of having that shared understanding and that shared language. It actually has given us so much. Um, it's actually helped make the craft a lot better and it should have made the process a little bit easier for us 
as professions or as professionals. Um, so I don't see it as a bad thing. I don't see design thinking as, as anything to, to be worried about. It's, it's how it's applied is what I really care about. And, and is um, that, what I would hate and is to that see. something that you're worried about, how it's been applied, being applied? Yes. So I, I fear for organizations thinking of it as a shortcut mm -hmm. and not really taking into consideration the craft of design. Mm -hmm. Like the, the whole um, experience of going through training is fantastic to become a design thinker, but the application of the knowledge and the experience of when something falls outside of those, those, those training classes, you don't have that experience of the craft to be able to say, well, actually, this is, I'm going to have to change tack here. Mm. I'm going to have to move to a different approach. And that only comes with an experience. I liken it to be the difference between a carpenter and a master craftsman. There's a difference. You'll still be able to make a table, but one of them will be marveled and the other one yeah. will just be able to be used. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's what are you going for? What are your, what are your outcomes you're trying to achieve? Mm. So design thinking, I always try and identify, I guess, to sum it up, um, are they thinking about the brand of design thinking like, you know, Dave Keeley's um, from IDEO who's, who's, you know, one of the four fathers of, of design thinking versus actually are they using the design thinking toolkit with a view to delivering an outcome? Mm, mm. Hopefully it's the latter. It's, it's really interesting that you said that. that you, I hear this a lot in the, in the design community that people are sort of rebelling against design thinking. And you said uh, regarding the trainings. What's, what sparked my interest in this conversation is that I think what people underestimate is their uh, design thinking and being a designer is also about certain um, uh, personality characteristics. Just the first thing that comes to my mind is like uh, the ability to be a great improviser, you know, to, to improvise on the spot or, or to, have, um, to be a great, yeah. uh, um, a great listener. And that, that's those kind of uh, threats or skills it's not something you uh, um, acquire in a two-day workshop, right? And that's, I think, something people miss. Absolutely. Like, I know John Kalko has spoken quite a lot about this, about the role of of making business people into designers and, you know, the role of design thinking in the process. Um, too often, like, I look for a mindset and I look for personality when I, when I interview people. Mm. How comfortable are they working within um, the process of change? is uh, is super important because what we do is is not it's not easy and not everyone can have that mindset and it, it can break a lot of people when you're working in mass dysfunction and it's being able to stick and have that resistance to to deliver something it's it's just super important and it's a personality trait that i try and dig deep into interviews to try and make sure that they've got that uh, in their in their locker, so to speak. What, what's the uh, for you the big question related to design thinking at this moment? I guess the big question is like, where do we go from here? Mm. Like wh what happens after design thinking has been applied into organizations? You know, mm -hmm. I, I actually did a, did a talk before I left Australia in a large organization of maybe like 60 to 70,000 people. And they, they'd spent four years training and they'd hit this point of saturation where they, everyone had you know, pretty much heard about design thinking and that shared knowledge was there. But what next? where do we go from here? Like, okay, we, we've hit that point of saturation where like now we've got mm. an organization that know what design thinking is, but nothing is changing. So um, too often it's it's the the behaviors of the organization and the cultural uh, communities and the, the tribalism that works uh, against the, uh, the methodology to succeed. Mm. So it's looking inwards is what I'm trying to say. Like, how are you working together? Like, what are you doing on a day-to-day -day basis? It's applying the design thinking methodology inward to really enable the, the growth. Um, and it's not just about, you know, having a deliverable on a Tuesday mm, afternoon mm, so it can be met with mm. the delivery team on a Wednesday. It's really about making the culture um, safe and making sure that, they, you know, that the people are able to grow as individuals, uh, making sure the environment. There's so many factors to be able to en enable design and innovation to succeed yeah, in an organization. Yeah. Design thinking can never be seen as a silver bullet. And, and the metaphor, uh, it's like design thinking, if that's the seed and if you don't put it in a, <laughs> I don't know, in a, in a, in a, out, out in a face and you don't give it water, you don't provide the right context, it, it won't ever flourish, right? Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. It's, it's like you, you, you have to provide and you have to encourage the behaviors yeah. of an organization to enable it to work. Yeah. 
And that may mean like the shift of power in an organization to be moved from the top down into the middle or mm. down into even the teams to be able to make educated decisions. At the end of the day, you should be hiring adults and there should be a, a culture of trust. They shouldn't be like trying to work against the the professionals mm. who they've hired, the smartest people in the room. I know Steve Jobs has got some fantastic quotes about this. I mean, if you're hiring the smartest people to come into your organization and you're not, you're not allowing them to do what they're doing, why are you hiring them? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, let's move on into topic number three, because uh, that's also a big one next to design thinking. And uh, maybe this one uh, is sort of the follow up to your question, what's next? Is this what's next? Let's see. Embedding service design. Again, the question. Uh, this is great. Yeah. Do you have a question starter? First of all, uh, and right. feel free to use uh, why again or surprise us with something yeah. completely different. Just how can we embed service embed design? Service design. All right. Um, how can we embed service design? Service design, I guess, um, the definition of it for me is just to, to wrap that up a little bit. Mm -hmm. It is nothing other than the design of of services and um i've seen hundreds of you know explanations that go paragraphs long and it's it is that okay look it, i just want to say it's it's the design of services it, it's nothing more fancy um how can we embed service design tactically there's a few things that i look at in organizations when i've, when I've been brought in to to help this process happen um first of all is the design maturity of the leadership team mm. and what i mean by that is what is designed for them and i do certain things like there's a, there's a few key books that i always try to purchase as presents and i drop them into the bags Which of the ones? leadership Can, team uh, transform by jerry mcgovern and i'm not saying that because he's irish and he's also another jerry um fantastic book it's about the the digital uh, rebel and it's about really uh, enabling that that culture to to wrap itself around the the methodology. Mm. That's one. And then um, I guess this is service design thinking, service design doing, which uh, I contributed to the latter. Um, I'm not just saying that's a fantastic book because uh, I had a very 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 small part to play in it, but it is a fantastic book to give to to people who are working currently in organisations that are doing mm. or they're delivering or they're shipping. And that's too often forgotten when we go in as service design practitioners. Um, more more than often, they're doing service design anyway. They're already doing it. Every business it's, is a service it's business. Like we're, we are yep. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's funny. I was speaking to my auntie um, only the other day, and she used to own a hotel in Ireland. And she was asking me, like, what are you doing these days? Like, wh wh why are you back? <laughs> why the beard? Why the glasses? <laughs> and I was like, look... I, I do service design. She's like, well, what is that? And I was like, well, look, you were doing service design for 50 years in Ireland before it was even a thing in Ireland. And I explained to her about the front office and the back office mm. and like, you know, the experience when you walk into the hotel. So quite often when you walk into an organization, whether it's a, it's a software business or a hotel, it's understanding that they're doing it, but it's also like, how can they do it better? Um, so what I tend to do is like I work with the leadership team to make sure that they understand what it is. So I, I, I create a, a shared understanding of what service design is, what it's not, and how we can work together. I'm trying to, trying to work out that little space in between. Um, then after that, I, I, I guess I, I move more into the tactical side of things. I, I look at what's currently happening in the organization, how the teams, how the office is structured, the placement of the teams, like in the logistics of the organization, like do they have Scrum? What are they working mm. on? And I'll identify a small piece that's like low risk, but I'll take them on the journey of, of going through that process. And it, I think it's it's really important to, to do that that type of tactical exercise to make sure that they feel comfortable enough that if they're going to give me money and I'm going to be taking people away from who are currently shipping service designers, shipping a mm -hmm. service, mm -hmm. and they're going to start working with me in a more of a strategic process, I define the outcomes that we're trying to achieve here. Like whether it's like um, working like through symbiosis with me, like on a day-to-day -day basis, and you're going to try and upskill this person to be able to, to take the craft and apply it after I've left the business. 
or it's um, just something that they, they want to do on a day-to-day basis. So I identify the small little pieces that we can actually work on and we wrap that up together and then we start working on it as, as regards the bigger overall strategic direction of, of a new service or a tactical service. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and, 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 and I'm thinking about embedding service design. Does this, what, what does this mean for you in terms uh, of uh, how does the organization change when service design is embedded? What, what is different when service design is embedded? Yeah, look, I don't know if the the answer to this question is if you go and you hire six service designers and put them in the corner and say we've we've now embedded them. Yeah, and it's it's a thing that um you know you you can hire service designers, but if the culture can't actually reciprocate, making it a place for them to grow and feel welcome, then it's it's not going to mm-hmm. happen. So um, as regards embedding service design into an organization, I think the thing called service design probably should change so it shouldn't really be called service design anymore it's more of a mindset and over time it should really blend into the the culture and it's just it's just a thing that happens Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and you've got champions who are like deep expertise in that thing to actually enable it so i'm not saying that in the future we're not going to have jobs. I'm saying like we're going to become, um, you know, there's going to be people who actually understand it a lot more and they're able to work with us on a more of a day-to-day basis and they'll have a deeper appreciation for the craft of what we do. But at the moment, when I, when I come back to Ireland now, like, and I, I look at it, the whole service design craft is, it's like 10 or 15 years ago from where it was in Australia and even Central Europe. It's, it's still a thing that is viewed with suspicion. They're like, isn't this just design thinking? Isn't this just this? So a, a large part of it is really enabling, um, I guess, raising the awareness of what service design is and you know what it can give to your business and what it can give to your organizations. Mm. And I fully agree. And I think we should be much more uh, aware that we need to articulate those kind of things. I think we are uh, pretty good at talking about how it works <laughs> and we should yeah. talk more, much more and much better at what it actually does, what it delivers, what the outcomes are, right? Uh, absolutely. I mean, like, if you're not delivering, you're not going to be embedding, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So it's that simple. Like, there, there was another point that um, I think Mark Stickdorn mentioned about... Brilliant the, guy, yeah. Yeah, no, the, the guy, he could do it for a living, couldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> could write a book about it. Um, uh, yeah, I could write a book about Mark Stickdorn, but like he, 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 he just, he's done it. So he, he's able to speak about it with, with confidence. And um, it's really about understanding the methodology and taking them on the journey. But it's the appreciation for research. And it's too, too often said, but... Uh, it was Mark that really uh, hit it home for me. It was the, the quality of research appreciation of, you know, how it's championed and how it's actioned. So I, I started doing a, a tool um, called uh, called the Wall of Pain. It's two years ago that I that I came up with this this methodology, where I map the customer journey map and I work with the the customer care team. So it could be a call center, it could be a uh like an online chat whatever it is whatever quant data you have i map it back against the the customer journey so the flow from awareness all the way through to exit and i work with the the team to identify the the main pain points on a day-to-day basis in the top five across the five stages of a customer journey so you could end up having like um certain tickets that have been coming in and it's just basically trying to close that feedback feedback loop but you'll end up having a a relatively static um, wall of pain after about a week or two. So these are the tickets that are recurring and it's how those problems are getting, you know, transacted and how they're getting placed back into the delivery team. But it's then taking it to the next level and putting a dollar value against Mm, each one of those tickets. mm, mm. So you're changing the conversation around, um, you know, what are the problems to how much it's costing yeah, yeah. and then taking it to the next level of accountability. Who Who's responsible for this? Because, you know, the customer is telling you there's a problem. How are you going to answer that? Mm, mm. 
and that that is the that is the most basic level of what we do and we're trying to close the conversational loop and i think these kind of conversations we should be having them much more with our clients that that would, that would propel our field much quicker than it's doing now absolutely i mean if if you want to close a conversation off with a business person um being able to articulate it on terms of a dollar value in terms of each one of the stages and where the opportunities are in terms of financial loss mm -hmm. It, can, it happens really quickly when you start putting a dollar value. I remember like I did this in um, a fantastic organization in Australia. I'm not going to name the names, <laughs> but I, I looked at it from um, an anthropological perspective where I, I observed the suspicion and I put up the wall of pain. And um, there's a fantastic CEO in, in Australia who owns this organization. And I think he thought I was a bit crazy. He was like, a wall of pain? But then I noticed over a week or two afterwards that whenever the investors were walking in, they would always stop at the wall of pain and he would be very <laughs> proud to talk about it. And he was like, this is the dollar value. And it's 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 a, such a simple tool, but it's actually bringing it closer back to the business conversation about what we can yeah. actually do in a day-to-day -day yeah. basis yeah. and making it transparent. Mm. Okay, Jerry, um, time is flying okay, by. I've got... Um, one more question for you, and I know you didn't prepare this one, so let's let's uh, ask me anything. Ask me anything. There we go. So, Jerry, um, is there a question that you'd like to ask us, the listeners and the viewers of the Service Design Show? Um, I guess the question that's been weighing on my mind recently is: Does accreditation in the service design community, or is it important? And I guess my thoughts on that is it's less so important. I, I don't think it's it's something we need to focus our attention on right now. I think we should be trying to build relationships across cross dis disciplinary uh, you know professions, and I'd hate to see accreditation to be seen as a form of ex exclusivity amongst uh, the professions as mm. like they're they're accredited they're they're not accredited. Mm. Um, for me, it's about getting uh, as as much diversity and inclusion into the service design community to help better articulate the needs and reflect what the work that we're trying to do. Um, I'd hate to see it to go uh, into an accreditation type uh, model where um, everyone who's who's been practicing this craft for, for years suddenly feels the need to go back and do a training course. Um, <laughs> so as much as I, you know, I appreciate the efforts of some some places, but I I just don't feel it's it's contributing to the success of service mm. design globally. Mm. Hey, great question. I have some opinions about it too, but I'm really interested to hear your opinions. So leave a comment on this episode um, and le let's see where this leads to, because I I do see a role for accreditation and I also understand your concern, but interesting discussion to follow mm. up. Um, Jerry, we are, we are heading towards the end of, uh, of our talk. And uh, the first thing I want to do is sort of thank you for your time and thank you for sharing what's been on your mind here on the Service Design Show. No worries. Th thanks so much for the opportunity to come on and talk. Like, I'm, I'm more than happy to be here. Awesome. So do you see a role for service design accreditation? Leave a comment down below and join the conversation. If you enjoyed this episode, please give a thumbs up. I really appreciate it. And of course, if you know someone who might benefit from what we've just discussed, please share this video with them. Thanks again for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.